All right, so I'm here with uh, Dr. Nick Ashford from MIT. He's a professor of technology and policy here at the school, and he's also an adjunct faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health. We're here to talk a little bit about climate change. Um, Dr. Ashford has expertise in this area, especially as it relates to technology. Um, I'd like to know, where do you think uh, we need to go as a nation and as a globe to address climate change? Um, do we have the technology now? What are some of the hang-ups? You know, I, um, let me, what I'll say at the beginning will draw a great deal on, a, on some research we did for the European Union. And uh, the European Union has asked the question, um, all right, we have global climate policies. How well do they align with other policies like innovation policy or research policy and so forth? So we looked at that and gave a report to, uh, for the attention of the commission. And in doing that, we exploded some, myth some mythologies. First of all, people argue that we have an innovation deficit, that we need more R&D in order to be addressing the problem. That's actually not true. We have the technologies right now, even excluding nuclear, to, mm. to basically make a very big dent on what I call and we call deep decarbonization. It's not enough to make the Paris Accord commitments. You have to go much further than mm. that. And uh, Jeff Sachs at the Earth uh, Institute at Columbia has pointed out that if we just pick the low-hanging fruit in order to make the Paris Accords, we may be in fact putting the wrong kind of technology in. If we are mm. really want to have a target on long-term reduction of global climate change, we have to be careful about what kind of technology we put in. Other kinds of mythologies are regulation kills innovation, which mm -hmm. it does not. Regulation kills jobs, which it does not. In fact, it does the opposite. Mm -hmm. It both creates innovation incentives and uh, creates new opportunities for employment. Mm -hmm. um, the failure of uh, us to be able to handle global climate mitigation is a political failure, mm -hmm. not a technological failure. Okay. And um, I I if the countries which have pledged to make their reductions in Paris come through, uh, we will have gone a long distance in at least taking the first steps. There's the danger that this country does not do that because of the emphasis on renewed interest in coal, uh, and the reduction uh, of strictures that were placed on the Obama's clean power plan. The three major uh, polluting and, and, and global climate uh, destroying activities are housing, food, and transportation. Mm. And, and individuals have a role to play in all, the, and, all of those things. And by housing, do you also mean heating and cooling of houses? I mean specifically heating and cooling. Okay. I mean the immediate uh, uh, contribution that individuals can make is to wear a sweater in the winter time and don't rather than and, the heating yeah right. right and don't use the whole air condition the whole house while you're at work mm -hmm. i mean things like simply a um a timer that sure. would put the heaters on or the air conditioning on would save an enormous amount of mm -hmm. of of, of, of wasted energy um and of course putting thermostats in your house multi-zone thermostats all of these things are really within reaching distance they're not very expensive to do but you could save an enormous amount of energy re related to housing, mm -hmm. if you do that, if there are rooms that you're not using in your house in the summer or the winter, you close those rooms off. You don't, you know, relegate yeah, the whole them. house. You, and these are relatively easy things to do. Sure, and save you money. Save money as well, and and um, you know, building a cultural consciousness is something which, of course, the government could facilitate uh -huh. by giving messages in that regard. On transportation, what becomes immediately obvious is, of course, that we have so much of the fleet of the automobiles are still old mm. uh, fleet. I remember I actually turned my minivan in, which was getting 15 miles to a gallon, when we had a cash for clunkers. And I bought oh, yeah. a, uh, a Toyota Prius, was, uh, Prius, which was what 48 miles to the gallon as mm. opposed to 15. That's big. I mean, that is a big difference. Yeah. Uh, the other area I wanted to talk about, mm -hmm. because I said that food was a major issue. Oh, sure. Uh, we know that if you, if we were not beef eaters, there'd be a, a great reduction in methane, which comes from, mm -hmm. as they say, belching cows, 
But even if we decided to have reduced meat content twice a week rather than five days a week, sure. there could have a tremendous impact almost immediately on the creation of greenhouse gases related to methane. So there are things that could be done. I think it's not promoted as a matter of culture. Mm -hmm. It's not tied to the profit in housing, uh, transportation and food, the entire food industry that uh, it could be. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no deliberate attempt mm -hmm. to really pay attention to the global climate change issue. And yet we're going, we're faced with the hottest summers we've had in right. years. Yeah. We're faced with weather events like the hurricane is about to hit yep. North Carolina. And uh, people don't make those connections and they don't understand how much individually they could do and how mm -hmm. much the government could do if we had the right kind of government. We are too many people on the planet living the lifestyle that some of us live. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth of the matter is that some of us consume too much and some of us don't consume enough. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, you have, for example, Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute, who got a prize from the German government for his uh, design and implementation of thermal houses that are that don't take from the grid in the summer or, or the winter. Mm -hmm. We don't do that in this country, but they do it in Germany. Right. And it was an American idea. And Carbon sequestration, if it's tied to forestry uh, and the absorption by uh, plants and algae, that's one thing. If we're talking about putting CO2 in caves and that like, I think really basically nonsense in terms uh -huh. of a permanent solution. We have the technology now mm -hmm between governmental activity and individual activity to really head off this disaster. Mm -hmm. But we're coming close to the tipping point where we're not going to be able to reverse the heating fast enough yeah. to withdraw. I mean, we're already suffering untoward weather events mm -hmm. and intensities. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, people who still insist that uh, that uh, it's some sort of a hoax mm -hmm. um, really are, are really flying in the face of, of really un, uh, irrefutable evidence. Right, right. Uh, we lack le leadership, we lack congressional leadership. Um, investing in coal is a terrible mistake. Sure. Um, in fact, this is not a, 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 an unsoluble problem. Mm -hmm. This and is a problem that could be gotten. Now, uh, one can ask why, why isn't that being done? Well. Uh, you know, the analysts will usually ask three questions. I ask four. The three questions okay. an analyst will usually ask is, what is, let's say in this case, what is unsustainable from a global climate perspective in terms of the way we run our industrial systems? And then secondly, what would a sustainable system look like? We can agree on those two questions. <clears throat> now, the third question is, what kind of carrots and sticks do you have to put? in place to make sure that the, the incentives are right to mm -hmm. do the right thing? And Academics and analysts end with those three questions, but there is another question. The other question is who's standing in your way? Uh -huh, yeah. And the fossil fuel industry is staying in our way. People who continue to produce large automobiles to gain per vehicle profits are standing in our way. An awful lot of economic actors are standing in our way and they have captured the agenda of governments both here and abroad. Mm. So we have we understand the problem, we understand what the solutions have to be. It's a question of political will and moving mm, people and, 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 and economic actors out of the way that are standing in the way of progress. What's the role that everyday people who aren't necessarily in a power position to implement those, what's the role of the, the everyday citizens to help bring about these changes? Well, they need, to, they need to pay attention as to how their representatives are voting mm -hmm. and their president is voting. Mm -hmm. They need to pay it. I mean, we have mechanisms in the states which are referenda and petitions and all kinds of things. So we have our, our collective power. We can change the name of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that people don't really understand what the source of the problem is and what the options for solutions are. So this is um, called Technology Globalization and Sustainable Development. Uh, this was authored by uh, Nick Ashford and Ralph Hall. You uh, be interested to know I read the original printing from cover to cover a few years ago when okay. it came out. Yeah, and uh, so now I'll have to update myself and, and read the Well, we, we give the solutions here. You, you shouldn't 
Listen to anybody who just tells you what the problems are. Right. If they don't also tell you what the solutions are. Well, thank you so much, You're uh, welcome. Dr. Ashford. Good to I really see you. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you as well. And I uh, look forward to keeping Congratulations on your new book. I think it raises some really important questions. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. All right, take care.